Welcome to the Atlantic Center for the Arts. The following is a reading by poet Jericho Brown, who is a master writer for our 2012 Your Word Teen Writing Residency, with an introduction by poet John Murillo. Jericho Brown is the author of Poetry Collection, Please, winner of the American Book Award, and also the recipient of the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, a Bunting Fellowship from the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard University, and a Whiting Writers Award, the coveted most, most coveted writing writers award. <laughs> he, was <laughs> he was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award, the Tom Gunn Award, and the Hurston Wright Poetry Prize. He has also received two travel fellowships to the Krakow Poetry Seminar in Poland. His poems appear in magazines including the American Poetry Review, Jubilat, Oxford American, Plowshares, and A Public Space, and in anthologies such as the 100 Best African American Poems, edited by Nikki Giovanni. In this fall, he joins the creative writing faculty at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Please give a warm round of applause for Jericho Brown. Prayer of the Backhanded. Not the palm, not the pear tree switch, not the broomstick, nor the closest extension cord not his braided belt, but God bless the back of my daddy's hand, which holding nothing tightly against me and not wrapped in leather eliminated the air between itself and my cheek. Make full this dimpled cheek unworthy of its unfisted print and forgive my forgetting the love of a hand hungry for reflex, a hand that took no thought of its target, like hail from a blind sky, involuntary, fast, but brutal in its bruising. Father, I bear the bridge of what might have been a broken nose. I lift to you what was a busted lip. Bless the boy who believes his best beatings lack intention, the mark of the beast. Bring back to life the son who glories in the sun, in the sin of immediacy, calling it love, God. Save the man whose arm, like an angel's invisible wing, may fly backward in fury, whether or not his son stands near. Help me hold in place my blazing jaw, as I think to say, excuse me. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to read a few poems from my first book, please. And also read a few poems from um, a book I just finished writing, a manuscript I just finished called The New Testament. Um, and I'll give terms and background where necessary before reading the poems. Odd Jobs. I spent what light Saturday sent sweating and learned to cuss, cutting grass for women kind enough to say they couldn't tell the damned difference between their mowed lawns and their vacuumed carpets just before handing over a $5 bill rolled tighter than a joint and asking me in to change a few light bulbs. I called those women old because they wouldn't move out of a chair without my help or walk without a hand at the base of their backs. I call them old and they must have been. They're all dead now, dead and in the earth I once tended. The loneliest people have the earth to love and not one friend their own age only mothers to baby them and big sisters to
to boss them around. Women, they want to please and pray for the chance to say please to. I don't do that kind of work anymore. My job is to look at the childhood I hated and say I once had something to do with my hands. Again, you are not as tired of the poem as I am of the memory. A returning toothache on either side of the mouth, an ingrown hair beneath the chin, simple it bruising, scratch. And again, I am bundled in Cousin Kenny's clothes from last school year, my hand held by my mother's. We walk as if the house behind us isn't warm enough for my feet. In the dark, we make a few blocks around the one-story neighborhood that I loved, though nothing I've written tells you this. I want to cut it out of me because turns out it never mattered. Right now, my mother's asleep on my father's chest. His arm has landed in the same place around her most of 30 years. Give a man a minute. She's asleep and I'm typing it all over again, everywhere. A man is shifting a bit to make his woman comfortable in his arms. I should have told you this lines ago. We walked back to the house we ran from because my mother loves her husband and his hands, even if laid heavy against her. I know you don't want to believe that, but give a man a minute. We're not done. My father loves his wife and the shape of her body, even if hunched in retreat, their son keeping up. I'm so sick of it. Another awful father scarring this page too. A bruising scratch. We walked back through an open door. And why don't I mention how he kissed my forehead before covering me on the couch that was my bed. Listen, and you can hear them in the next room, planning names for the youngest of us, then making love loud enough for the oldest to learn. This next poem is titled after a word that's a very um, southern word. I stopped hearing it for a while after I moved to the West Coast, and now I hear it all the time that I'm back in Georgia. Um, it's a word that means, um, it really means that person and all the people that you associate with that person. And it's usually, um, it's usually preceded by someone in somebody's family. Um, the, word is, the word is nim. And so the way a phrase, uh, the way a sentence would work in which the word is used is, um, have you been over to your mom and him house? Or um, I'm about to, I'm gonna go outside and play with Randy Nim, like that, so. 
Nim. They said to say good night and not goodbye. Unplugged the TV when it rained. They hid money in mattresses, so to sleep on decisions. Some of their children were not their children. Some of their parents had no birth dates. They could sweat a cold out of you. They'd wake without an alarm telling them to. Even the short ones reached certain shelves. Even the skinny cooked animals too quick to get caught. And I don't care how ugly one of them arrived. That one got married to somebody fine. They fed families with change and wiped their kitchens clean. Then another century came. People like me forgot their names. <clears throat> Revelation. This is the book of three diseases. Close it and you're caught running from my life nearer its end now that you've come so far for a man sick in his blood left long and mind. I think of him mornings I wake panting like a runner after his best time. He sweats. He stops in front of what burned. The house that graced this open lot was a red brick. Children played there. Two boys. Their father actually came home. Mama cooked as if she had a right to the fire in her hands, to the bread I ate before I saw doctors who helped me fool you into believing I do anything other than the human thing. We breathe until we don't. Every last word is contagious. From the King James Version. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. First Corinthians 13 and 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I even had a child's disease. I ran from the Doberman like all children on my street. But old men called me special. The Doberman caught up, chewed my right knee. Limp now in two places, I carried a child's Bible like a football under the arm that didn't ache. I was never alone. I owned my brother's shame of me. I loved the words thou and thee. Both meant my tongue in front of my teeth. Both meant a someone speaking to me. So what if I itched? So what if I couldn't breathe? I climbed the cyclone fence like children on my street and went first when old men asked for a boy to pray or read. Some had it worse. Nobody whipped me 
with a water hose or a phone cord or a leash. Folks said I'd grow into my face. And when I did, I died. Um, this, this, this next poem is written in the voice of um, the person I always think of as my first poet. Uh, and when I say that, I say that in the same, in the same way that we think of a, a first love or a first kiss. Uh, some, what I'll never forget is being a, um, being a kid. I was fortunate enough to have a mother who couldn't afford childcare, so she would drop drop us off at the library when she needed us taken care of. Um, and we would, we would sit there and read books all day. And uh, I remember coming across these poems and, and, and falling in love, you know. Um, what do you need to know? Uh, the poem is written in the voice of the, the leading figure of the Harlem Renaissance uh, who wrote The Negro Speaks of Rivers at the age of 18. Uh, every time I think about Langston Hughes writing The Negro Speaks of Rivers when he was only 18 years old. Do y'all know that poem, The Negro Speaks of Rivers? You have to read that poem. Go Google it as soon as you leave here. It's so good. Oh my God. Every time I think about him writing that when he was only 18, I really hate Langston Hughes. Um, the, the poem also mentions uh, the Empress of Blues, Bessie Smith, who is Langston Hughes's favorite singer. And um, it references his testimony before the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Un-American Activities During McCarthyism and the Red Scare of the, the 1950s. Langston, blue. O blood of the river of songs. O songs of the river of blood, let me lie down. Let my words lie sound in the mouths of men repeating their invocations pure and perfect as the moans that amount in the mouth of Bessie Smith. Blues for the angels kicked out of heaven. Blues for the angels who miss them still. Blues for my people and whatever water they know. Oh, weary drinkers drinking from the bloody river, why go to heaven with Harlem so close? Why sing of rivers with a daddy of my own to miss? I remember him and taste a stain like blood coursing the body of a man chased by a mob. I write his running, his sweat. Here he climbs a poplar for the sky, but it is only sky. The river, follow me, you'll see. We tried to fly and learned we couldn't swim. Dear singing river full of my blood, are we as loud under water. Is it blood that binds brothers? Or is it the Mississippi running through the fattest vein of America? When I say home, I mean I wanted to write some lines. I wanted to hear the blues. But here I am, swimming in the river again. What runs through the fat veins of a drowned body? What America can a body call home? When I say Congo, I mean blood. When I say Nile, I mean blood. When I say Euphrates, I mean, if only you knew what blood we have in common. So much in Louisiana, they call a man like me red, and red was too dark for my daddy, and my daddy was too dark 
for America. He ran like a man from my mother and me. And my mother's sobs are the songs of Bessie Smith, who wears more feathers than death. Oh, the death my people refuse to die. When I was 18, I wrote down the river, though I couldn't win a race. Climbed a tree that winter, then fell flat on my wet red face. Line after line, I read all the time, but there was nothing I could do about race. Janis Joplin recorded the Gershwin Standard Summertime with Big Brother and the Holding Company for their 1968 chart-topping album, Cheap Thrills. Uh, she died of a heroin overdose in 1970. She was 27 years old. Track five, Summertime as performed by Janis Joplin. God's got his eye on me, but I ain't a sparrow. I'm more like a lawnmower. No, a chainsaw. Anything that might mangle each manicured lawn in Port Arthur, a place I wouldn't return to if the mayor offered me every ounce of oil my daddy cans at the refinery. My voice, I mean, ain't sweet. Nothing nice about it. It won't fly, even with Jesus watching. I don't believe in Jesus. The Baxter boys climbed a tree just to throw persimmons at me. The good and perfect gifts from above hit like lightning, leave bruises. So I lied. I believe, but I don't think God likes me. The girls in the locker room slapped dirty pads across my face. They called me bitch, but I never bit back. I ain't a dog. Chainsaw, I say. My voice hacks at you. I bet I tear my throat. I try so hard to sound jagged. I get high and say one thing so many times, like Willie Baker who worked across the street. I saw some kids whip him with a belt while he repeated, please. School out, summertime, and the living lashed. Mama said I should be thankful that the town's worse to coloreds than they are to me, that I'd grow out of my acne. God must love Willie Baker, all that leather, and still a please that sounds like music. See? I wouldn't know a sparrow from a mockingbird. The band plays. I just belt out, please, this tune ain't half the blues. I should be thankful. I get high and moan like a lawnmower so nobody notices. I'm such an ugly girl. I'm such an ugly girl. I try to sing like a man. Boys call, boy. I turn my face to God. I pray, I wish I could pour oil on everything green in Port Arthur. So, so the, only, the only thing you have to know for this next poem is the myth of Persephone, and to remind you, uh, Persephone was the daughter, uh, in Greek mythology, Persephone is the daughter of Demeter, who's the goddess of agriculture, uh, one day she was playing in a meadow. Um, the god of the underworld, Hades, sniffed her out, fell in love, kidnapped her, and took her back to the underworld. Um, while she was in the underworld, she ate 
uh, you're not supposed to be eating while you're in the, in the underworld because if you do, then you don't um, get to come back to this world. Um, because she ate in the underworld, uh, the, God, the king of the gods, Zeus, cut a deal with Demeter and Hades that he would have Persephone for half of the year, which is our, um, which is our fall and winter, I imagine. Uh, since during that time, Demeter is so sad to be without her daughter, she doesn't allow anything to grow. And uh, then Demeter gets her for the spring and the summer uh, because she's so happy to have her daughter back. Things grow enough for me to sneeze the entire time. Persephone, at the end of hell. But what if I love him? The one they call bad, the one they call black, the one with the gap in his teeth, only I get to see. What if I risk taking the head of death here in the dark, far and deep, where burrowing beasts build house after filthy house and nobody witnesses my underworld gangster play kidnap play mama's baby turned queen and if i scream pastel he swears he's sorry unties my feet what if that's worth a few bruises better than the light called spring and I love it every drop of God weeping over me mm -hmm. turning 26 it's obviously a very recent poem Turning 26, you remember me pushing shoulder first out of your body into a spiral of birthdays and bruises. It must have hurt something awful when I left you to your husband like the mouse traps he set so well. Now I am full of cake, I am sick with candles. I am 26 and skinny with a back too narrow to bear a cross or carry a woman from a burning house. I ran empty handed and can't reach far enough, all because I hold a grudge, a candle lodged at the portal of my throat but we should sing happy birthday to me anyway, at the same time, in different cities. Celebrate, like light candles, and make a wish for me. I'll light mine and burn like your house. Like father, my father's embrace is tighter now that he knows he is not the only man in my life. He whispers, remember when and I love you as he holds my hand hungry for a discussion of Bible scriptures over breakfast. He pours cups of coffee I can't stop spilling. My father's embrace is firm and warm now that he knows. He begs forgiveness for anything he may have done to make me turn to abomination as he watches my eggs scrambled, soft, yolk runs all over the plate. A rubber band binds the morning 
paper. My father's embrace tightens. Grits stiffen. I hug back like a little boy, gripping to prove his handshake. Daddy squeezes me close, but I cannot feel his heartbeat, and he cannot hear mine. There is too much flesh between us, two men in love. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. It's easier actually for me. In the moment of writing a persona poem, I actually feel more like myself um, and more free to say whatever the hell I want to say. You know, I mean, in truth, I often feel like, I mean, this sounds ridiculous, but it's the truth. I often feel like I'm such an ugly girl. I'm such an ugly girl. But, um, you know, that's just ridiculous in a poem in which I'm the speaker <laughs> or a lot of fun. Uh, um, so, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, it just it frees me to say certain things that I otherwise may not be able to say. I mean, sometimes I find myself writing lines that. I don't necessarily know the source of, and what helps is understanding that the persona poem is there for me to always give it a source if I need to do that later. Uh, and if I do give it a source later on, then once I, once I give it that source, then that'll help me finish the poem. Um, you, know, um, you know, I'm not a sparrow is probably a line that I can write without knowing anything about Janis Joplin. But then because I love Janis Joplin and I know a few things about her, I can then follow that up with some things about Port Arthur, Port Arthur, Texas, a place that I'm not from because I know about her. Do you understand what I'm saying? So any other questions? Do I what? Yeah, I mean, I think about other things. I just try to think about other things like that I can see something wrong with. And then I try to apply that to the poem, which means it's something I was telling y'all earlier today. It's something I can't really translate. So I think about a performance that I really like. Right. Huh? Yeah, like this, like ultimately what I do when I'm revising a poem, like I'll get to a point in the poem that I think something is wrong with it. And when I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with it, I'll say something to myself like, this needs more bass, which I don't really know. I know that that's true about the poem and that's what I need to do to fix it, but I don't know how to translate. I mean, I know how to translate in poem language what to do to your poem, but I don't know how to translate in poem language what to do to my own, you know? So, I can I can be in the middle of writing a poem and think to myself, now it's got to holla, or now it's got to hit a high note, or you, do you know what I'm saying? Or like, why is there no piano solo? You know, what I mean? like I can do that for some reason, and then that's what usually helps me revise. And I think uh, what I was saying in class earlier today, it's really good whenever you're revising to have some sort of a metaphor for your writing that you can turn to. And for me, music has always been that. I mean, there's other things that have been the metaphor, maybe something like running, because I can think about pacing or, or something like that, or like track and field and that kind of stuff. But, but some, some music is really, for me, a really good metaphor to turn to. And I, I don't think it has to be music for everybody. I think it has to be that other thing that you love doing, even if that other thing is just talking on the phone. Like, how is that like what you're trying to accomplish? You know, how is having a good conversation like what you're trying to accomplish in this poem or, or whatever? You know. Yeah. Um, it depends on the poem. It's usually about an hour. Yeah. No, I'm lying. No, I mean, this, 
No, that's true. That's actually true. I said that to Nicole yesterday, and I think she got mad at me or something. It usually, <laughs> it takes me about an hour. The problem that I have as a human being that I probably shouldn't say is that there's a lot of distance between poems for me where I'm very upset. I'm collecting lines. Like I collected a few lines today and yesterday that were said in class. Like people say things and I type those things out. And then I, okay. And then, I, uh, and then I'll go back and I look at those at some point. I try to make poems out of those. But I always have like a running list of things. And at some point, I mean, and I'm always looking back at those things. And at some point I get overtaken by one of them or some of them so that they're always, excuse me, so that they're always like in my mind. Do, do you understand what I mean? Um, and then once I get overtaken by them in, the, in my mind and they start like making themselves into something, that's when I go to the computer and I sit down. But because they, they're, they're sort of formed in a way in my mind, when I sit down, it's, it's like transcribing. Do, do you know what I mean? So it's like, the, the other thing is, I mean, what's different between me and probably the way Nicole writes a poem is that when I write a poem, I sit down, I write the poem, and I think it's good. And then I don't look at it again until I've written 60 other poems, um, which is problematic for me because I don't, like a lot of poem people, a lot of poets send out to magazines, but I've never sent out to magazines at the moment of, oh, I wrote a good, I finished this poem now, I put it with the batch. I don't do that. I just let the poems revise each other. So the only reason it actually takes me an hour to write a poem, it probably takes more than an hour, but that's only because I need like 60 other poems to figure out what that one poem is about or what it needs to do or how its line breaks look or how it needs to be different from those other 60 or how it needs to be like those other 60. Do you understand what I'm saying? So then like, I guess that is another 30 minutes. So maybe it's an hour and a half. Uh, exactly, exactly, exactly. Cause like after I write, I really do like after I write a poem, I don't really think I've written a poem. Like I just kind of put it away and I trust that there'll be other poems, and then when there are other poems, that's when I'm like, okay, now it's time. The problem is, in order to write like that, you have to be patient enough to wait like four years, which is pretty much what I do, because it's not like I got anything. I have plenty to do in the meantime, you know, so. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>